So my hadith from the compilation of Imam Abdul Ghani Al-Maqdisi Rahmatullah Ta'ala known as Umdatul Ahkam. Which he compiled as Umdatul Ahkam. And we specifically put these majalis on Thursday, Thursday afternoon. Why? Because Shara'an, this is now Friday evening in the lunar calendar, then the night precedes the day. First the night comes and then the day comes after that, Friday night and then Friday day. So what we call as Friday evening is actually Saturday evening from the lunar perspective. So this is actually Friday evening, Friday evening. And the Sunnah of the Dawood, Sayyidina Ausa Thakfi radiallahu ta'ala an, said that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said that inna min afdali ayyamikum yawm al-jum'ah from the most excellent, the best of your days is the day of Friday. So what should you do? فَأَكْثِرُ عَلَيَّ مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ فِي So you should increase in your salutations upon me on the day of Friday. And the day of Friday includes the night which precedes the day. The day and the night, both of them are included. On the day of Friday, then you should increase in your salutations upon me. فَإِنَّ صَلَاتَكُمْ مَعَوْلَةٌ عَلَيَّ Because your salutations are presented to me. And then the Sahaba of the Prophet وسلم, they asked him, كَيْفَ تُعْرَضُ صَلَاتُنَا عَلَيْكَ لَيَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ How are our salutations presented to you? After you have died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, يَقُولُونَ بَنِيْتَ Saying after you, you, have, you have decayed in the earth, your, your body has gone. He said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ حَرَّمَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ أَجْسَادَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden the earth to consume the bodies of the prophets alayhim salatu wassalam. Their physique, their body, their stature remains intact by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So on the day of Friday, فَأَكْثِرُوا عَلَيَّ مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ فِيهِ Hence why we have this dars of hadith on this Friday evening. So we can combine this between learning, between learning about our deen, and performing this action of whenever we hear the name of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or saying Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam in the hadith of Sunan Al-Kubra of Imam Al-Bayhaqi Rahmahullah Ta'ala then our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave a good news for us, a glad tiding that فَمَنْ كَانَ أَكْثَرُهُمْ عَلَيْهَا صَلَاةً كَانَ أَقْرَبُهُمْ مِنِّي مَنْزِلًا Whoever among my ummah is at the foremost of sending these salutations upon me and they will be the closest to me in proximity on Yom Al-Qiyamah. They will be the nearest people to me on Yom Al-Qiyamah and Bittifaqi Ulama. Then the Muhaddithun will be right there next to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wa Sallam. Why? Because they spend their whole lives, all their days and all of their nights in Qala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam. An Abi Huraira Tafala Qala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam. No pain you will find in the books of the Hadith except you will find the salutation center on Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wa Sallam. So, we are still in Babun Jami, <coughs> the comprehensive chapter in Kitab al-Salah, in the book of the prayer for Al-Umdatul Ahkam. Last week we took the hadith which discusses what a person should do if they have an excuse not to pray. Okay, remember what, what the excuses which are allowed for you not to pray? The forgetfulness. Forgetfulness and, sleep, sleep. and sleeping, mashallah. If you forget or if you sleep on your prayer, then what should you do? How do you... How do you recompensate for that prayer? Is by making it up as soon as you remember la kafarata la illa dharik. There is no compensation for it other than that, except to offer it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa salata li dhikri. Establish your prayer for my remembrance. Once you remember me, remember your salah, establish that prayer you have forgotten, you have slept on. La kafarata la illa dharik. There is no expiation for it other than that. There is no wealth you can give, there is no amount of days you can fast to make up for that. Only and only by recompensating that prayer, by offering it, once you remember, is the only route to, to make up for that prayer. So the next hadith brought by the author, Rahmahullah Ta'ala, is the hadith of the Jabir ibn Abdullah. Radiallahu Ta'ala, Rahmahullah. So the Jabir ibn Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Haram. Radiallahu Ta'ala, Rahmahullah. Where he says, أن المعاذ بن جبل رضي الله تعالى عنه كان يصلي مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم العشاء الآخرة ثم يرجع إلى قومه فيصلي بهم تلك الصلاة. وسيدنا جابر رضي الله تعالى عنه he describes what was the action of سيدنا معاذ بن جبل رضي الله تعالى عنه where he would 
pray with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-Isha al-Akhira the later Isha <coughs> the later of the Isha why? because what they call in Arabic Salat al-Maghrib and Salat al-Isha or al-Isha'in the two Isha's Salat al-Maghrib and Salat al-Isha likewise Salat al-Dhuhr and Salat al-Asr are called as Dhuhrain the two Dhuhrs Dhuhr and Asr similar to Adhan Adhan and Iqama are both called Adhan like the Prophet said that بَيْنَ كُلْ بَيْنَ الْأَذَانَيْنِ صَلَاةً between the two adhans is a salah. It's two rak'ahs for you to offer between the two adhans between adhan and iqama. They both share the same name. The sun and the moon. Both of them are called as qamarain. The two moons. Uh, dates and water. Both are called as aswadain. The two black things. Day, uh, water and dates. So similarly, isha and maghrib. Both are called as isha'ain. The two isha's. So Sayyidina Mu'ad radiallahu anhu would offer with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-Isha al-Akhira the later Isha meaning actually Salat al-Isha not Salat al-Maghrib but Salat al-Isha ثُمَّ يَرْجِعُ إِلَىٰ قَوْمِ then he would return back to his people back to his tribe where he used to live in al-Madina فَلْيُصَلِّي بِهِمْ تِلْكَ الصَّلَىٰ and he would lead them in that prayer in their Salat al-Isha their Salat al-Isha would be delayed because of Sayyidina Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala Initially offering with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa in Masjid al-Nabawi, with the Jama'ah, with the rest of the Sahaba, and then he would return back to his tribe, back to his people of the Ansar, in their locality, and establish, he would lead them in their Salah, Salat al-Isha. And many of us, we, are, we close to who said in the Mu'ad, radiallahu ta'ala, anhu, who he is. Many of us, we are aware of the great Sahaba, of the Khulafa Rashidin, but many of us, we are unaware who Sayyidina Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu is. And perhaps one of the, these iconic moments of who Sayyidina Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu is, <clears throat> is when he was, when the Prophet sallallahu commanded him to go to the people of Yemen, to go down south as a da'iyah, as a sheikh, as an alim, as a murabbi, as a teacher, as a caller, to go and to call, give da'wah to the people of Yemen. And the Prophet وسلم, would go, he walked with Sayyidina Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala all the way to the outskirts of Medina, going with him, both of them having tears in their eyes. And he said to Sayyidina Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala, O oh, Mu'ad, innaka asaka alla talqani ba'd aami hadha. That O oh, Mu'ad, with tears in his eyes, perhaps O oh, Mu'ad, that you will not meet me after this year of mine. You will tamurru bi masjidi, you will come by my masjid, wa tamurru bi qabri, and you will pass by my grave. You will not meet me after this year of yours, after, after this year of mine, O oh, Mu'ad bin Jabal. Wallahi ya Mu'ad, inni la uhibbuk. Wallahi, O oh, Mu'ad, by Allah, I express my love for you, O oh, this is your Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Bidding him to have an. And in the height of Anas radiallahu ta'ala, in Sunan Tirmidhi, Sunan Nasai, Sunan Ibn Majah. Then the Prophet Sallallahu describes some of his Sahaba. And he said that, Arham ummati bi ummati Abu Bakr. That the most merciful of my ummah. To my ummah, he said that Sallallahu Akbar radiallahu ta'ala. He said that Abu Bakr, he is the most merciful of my ummah to the rest of my ummah. And all he was a soft-hearted, gentle, said that Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala. Wa ashadduhum fi amri Allah Umar. And the most severe and fervent and strict among them, the most strictest among them, upon the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, wa asdaquhum haya al Uthman, and the most truthful of them in bashfulness, of in, in, in shyness, is Sayyidina Uthman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, wa aqdahum al, and the greatest judge among my ummah, the one who has, the one who has uh, the Prowess of jurisprudence is Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala an wa aqra'uhum li kitab illahi ubayyu ibn Ka'ab the greatest reciter among them of the Qur'an is Sayyidina Ubayy bin Ka'ab radiallahu ta'ala an wa a'lamuhum bil halal wal harami mu'adhu bin Jabal and the most knowledgeable among my ummah of halal and haram of ahkam of fiqha is Sayyidina Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala. So Sayyidina Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala 
being attested to by the Prophet ﷺ as being أَعْلَمٌ بِالْحَلَالِ وَالْحَرَامِ أَفْقَهُ هَذِي الْأُمَّةِ The greatest faqih, Sayyidina Mu'adh bin Jabal, he would do this practice. And this is what we call as hadith taqreeri. Hadith taqreeri, a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ has not spoken any words, he has not performed any actions, but rather he has approved the action of Sayyidina Mu'adh bin Jabal and he will come to some of, the, uh, uh, some of the objections of the Ahnaf <coughs> and how the Prophet وسلم, his own fi'il, his own action approves the action of Sayyidina Mu'adh bin Jabal The Ahnaf, for example, what did they say? They do not take this hadith and act upon it. That if a person, a person who is praying behind somebody, then they are allowed to have a different niyyah. They do not allow a muftarid to pray behind a mutanaffi. Somebody who is praying their fard prayer to pray behind somebody who is offering a nafil prayer. Like we have here. We say that Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala he would offer his fard with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And then he would go back to his hay, back to his locality, back, back, back to his people. And then he would offer them a salah which was nothing for him. Which was voluntary for him and for them it would be their fard prayer. For them it would be their obligatory prayer. It would be their salat al-isha or four rak'ah shawajib. On them, and for him, Sayyidina Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala, he would be offering a nafil prayer, he would be offering a voluntary, a supererogatory prayer, a prayer which is not a, or an obligatory one. And they say, why? Why do they not accept this? <clears throat> they say, because the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu when he says that, the one who is the greatest party, who has the greatest knowledge of Quran, of Tajweed, of Ahkam, he should lead the people in salah. So from here, they derive that the Imam should be in a better position than the Ma'moon. The Imam should be in a better position than the one who is praying behind him. So based on this principle, they say that it's not befitting for, for example, a blind person to lead somebody who is non-blind in salah. It is not befitting for a young, a, for a child to lead an elder in salah. Similarly, it is not befitting, nor is it permissible, for somebody who is praying a nafil prayer to lead somebody who is praying a fard prayer. Because the fard is in a greater position than the nafil. Nafil is something, if you, whether you perform it or whether you do not perform it, you incur no punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you miss out your fard prayer, then you will incur sin by Allah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they make this ta'ala which we see as a tradition from the Ahlul Ra'i, from the people of opinion and Ra'i and Qiyas and analogy, where in the presence of Nas, in the presence of a text from Quran or Hadith, they prefer a principle based on Ra'i, a principle based on Qiyas, a principle they have concocted based on analogy, in opposition to a clear, explicit, sarih text from the, and we mentioned the hadith of, hadith of Ammad al-Ahkam, where they taken from? Bukhari and Muslim. Bukhari and Muslim. So this hadith is taken from Bukhari and Muslim. That this is what the Sayyidina Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala will do, and the Prophet approved his action. But yet, in opposition to, the, opposition to this, they'll bring this principle, this qaida, that the Imam should be in a better position than the Ma'moon. The Imam should be in a more lofty position than the person who he is leading in salah. And this is a qaida which no doubt it is fasina. No doubt it is a, a false principle to have. Why? Because there's no qiyas. There's no analogy in the presence of a text. In the presence of Allah said, His Messenger said, then there's no room for any analogy, there's no room for any rai. Hence why, for example, Imam Ahmad, rahmahullah ta'ala, he has some poetry attributed to him. Either him or his son. Imam Ahmad or Imam Abdullah ibn Imam Ahmad. Where? He says that Deen al Nabi Muhammad al Akhbar. Deen al Nabi Muhammad al Akhbar. نعم المطية للفة الآثار How excellent of a riding animal for a student are the آثار the ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam 
لا ترغبن عن الحديث وأهله Do not turn away from hadith and his people فالرأي ليل والحديث نهار Because the رأي opinion is darkness والحديث نهار And the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, is the daytime is the, is the sun shining bright In opposition to رأي and قياس That is ظلمة That is ليل لا ترغبن عن الحديث وأهله Do not turn away Do not turn away from hadith and his people and prefer qiyas and rai over the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So for example, they say that it is not befitting hence why for a child to lead a elder person in salah because the elder person is more deserving to lead the salah. But we find for example in Sahih Bukhari, the interesting example of Sayyidina Amr ibn Salama radiallahu ta'ala where he lived far away from the Prophet sallallahu and when the person began his da'wah, began his call, then Sayyidina Amr bin Salama radiallahu ta'ala, they lived close to a, uh, an oasis, close to a place where there was water. So hence why their locality would be a place where travelers and people who pass by, they would stop and they would rest. They would allow their animals to drink water, their horses, their camels to drink water while they are on their journey. And then them themselves would have some rest, and they would eat, and they would have, have some rest. <coughs> so they would question the travelers who came to them, that what is the news of this man in Mecca, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This was the Facebook and the Snapchat and the Instagram of that day, social media of that time. That what was, what was what's the news, what's happening, what's, uh, what's been brought to him? And they would tell him and they would read, so they would memorize Quran. And they are non-Muslims. The tribe of Amr ibn Salama radiallahu anhu, they were non-Muslims. And they would be fascinated with the Quran, which would be given to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So with these travelers, when they came, and they said, yeah, yeah, he says some Quran has been given to him, and they would read some Quran, Sayyidina Amr ibn Salama, he would memorize that Quran. And this, imagine this kept on going, kept on going until Fath Makkah. Until Makkah was conquered by the Prophet in the eighth year of Hijrah. From the beginning of the da'wah till the Fath of Mecca, the, uh, the people of Amr bin Salama, his tribe, his locality, they are receiving travelers, they are receiving news, and they are receiving Quran which is coming to the Prophet Sallallahu And Sayyidina Amr bin Salama as a non-Muslim, as a young boy, he is memorizing the Quran because he is a sharp, bright, he is a sharp-minded young lad, sharp-minded young boy. He is a non-Muslim and he's, he's learning Quran as it comes to him bit and pieces, in bits and pieces. Until the day of Fath Makkah and his tribe, they accept Islam and they go to Makkah and they accept Islam with the Prophet Sallallahu And now they have accepted Islam, it is incumbent on them to pray five times a day. And among them they have to pray in Jama'ah, the Fajr, Maghrib and Isha, or Salawat Jahriya, loud audible prayers. So they could find nobody in their locality who has Qur'an other than Amr ibn Salama radiallahu ta'ala who he was a young boy, seven, eight years old seven, eight years old and he was the one who memorized the most Qur'an among them after all these years of listening to riders, passers-by, travelers bringing news of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to them so the Prophet made him an imam for his people a young boy, seven, seven, six, seven, eight years old boy and the person made him as an imam for his people. So how can we take this qaid that which the Ahanaf have devised in opposition to this very clear hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Likewise, the example I gave of the one who is blind and the one who is not blind. That when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would leave Medina to go for his ghazawat, go for his expeditions, then most of the time he would leave behind <coughs> The, uh, uh, the cousin of Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha who is Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum radiallahu ta'ala anha Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum radiallahu ta'ala anha who would leave him behind as an imam for the people who could not attend that ghazwa who could not attend that battle as an imam for them and how did Allah describe him? Abasa wa tawalla an ja'ahu al basir <laughs> when the one who, was, who, had, who had sight came to him and Ja'ahu Al-A'ma The one who was blind came to him He was a blind person And the Prophet ﷺ left him as an Imam For the people left behind in the people of Al-Madinah So this Qaida That the Imam has to be in a more 
virtuous position that the one who is leading in is a qaida which is batila, which is fasida, which is false and which is corrupted. Also they use the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam which we took previously of Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala that innama ju'il innama ju'il al-imamu li'utamma bihi fa'idha kabbara fakabbiru wa'idha raka'a farka'u wa'idha sajada fasjudu that the imam has been made to be followed the imam has been placed in order that he be followed so when he says Allahu Akbar then you follow him and you say Allahu Akbar. When he goes into Ruku', then you follow him and you go into Ruku'. When he goes into Sujood, then you follow him and go into Sujood. And the ending of the Muslim said that فَلَا تَخْتَلِفُوا عَلَيْهِ Do not differ with your Imam. Do not have مُخَالَفَ فَلَا تَخْتَلِفُوا عَلَيْهِ Do not engage in differing with your Imam. So they say here, the Muslim said فَلَا تَخْتَلِفُوا You should not be different to your Imam. Rather you should follow the Imam, you should follow him. So if your niyyah is different and his niyyah is different, then you have differed with him in your niyyah. We say no. This hadith is about the harakat in the prayer, about the movements in the salah. You are not allowed to go into ruku' before the imam goes into ruku'. You are not allowed to stand up from ruku' before the imam stands. You are not allowed to say ameen before the imam says, you are not allowed to say taslim before the imam says taslim. This hadith is about the harakat and the movements and the sakanat in the prayer, not about the niyyah of the prayer. Another evidence that we use <coughs> is the, we use to dispel this is the salatul khawf of the Prophet ﷺ. Salatul khawf, the prayer of fear. When in the midst of battle, midst of war, then the prayer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed some lenience in the salah. فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ أَن تَقْصُرُوا مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ إِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَنْ يَفْتِنَكُمُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا If you fear that the enemy will attack you, then there's no problem upon you that you shorten your prayer. أَن تَقْصُرُوا That you shorten your prayer. And in another ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that Rukbanan, either if you are riding or if you are, uh, even if you are walking, then you still have to off engage in your prayer and offer your salawah which are fard upon you. So in the Salatul Khawf of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then he, Salatul Khawf, it will come I think in his own chapter, very interesting prayer, where the Prophet would stand in, uh, as the Imam and there would be in front of him a row of Sahaba guarding and then a row behind him who are praying. So he would stand up Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they would pray two rak'ahs <coughs> for Salat al-Dhuhr or Salat al-Asr, two rak'ahs. Two rak'ahs and what did Allah say? فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جَنَهُنْ أَنْ تَقْصُرُوا If you, for you to shorten your prayer. So in Salat al-Khawr the Prophet shortened his prayer from four to two. <coughs> After two rak'ahs then the Sahaba behind, they would switch with the Sahaba in front. So those who were praying, they would finish their prayer and then they would go and the people who were, the Sahaba who were in front, protecting and guarding, they would go behind and they would offer two rak'ahs with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam. So, now the mas'ala is, <clears throat> after the first two rak'ahs the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has prayed, then that's the Salat al dhuhr finished. Because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has allowed to shorten four rak'ahs to two rak'ahs in a position of khawf. In a situation of fear, a circumstance of fear, where the enemy combatant is in front of you, then there's فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ أَن تَقْصُرُوا مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ So he shortens his prayer to two rak'ahs. So then the question, what did he lead those other two, other sahaba in two rak'ahs then? He couldn't, he can't pray two dhuhrs. What did he pray then? Asr. No, no. He prayed nafil. Yeah. Two rak'ahs of nafil. And for those sahaba, it was fard for them. Yes. So then it is allowed for a muftarid to pray behind a mutanaffil. No. It is allowed for a, somebody who has a different niyyah, a niyyah of fard, to pray behind somebody who has a niyyah of a voluntary, of nafil. No. So hence why this hadith of Sayyidina Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala an has no objections to it. Mm. That perhaps Sayyidina Mu'adh was offering f uh, nafil first and then he offered fard, no. He offered fard with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then he went back and he offered nawafil for his people. So similarly, we can apply this hadith <coughs> in uh, a question where people always they ask about Salat al-Taraweeh. Where they come late for Salat al-Taraweeh and they have not prayed 
Isha yet. So they say, am I allowed to join the Imam in Salat al-Taraweeh while I am praying Salat al-Isha? And the answer is, yes. You can pray behind the Imam who is offering Salat al-Taraweeh two rak'ahs and when he concludes his prayer, then you must stand up and offer two more rak'ahs to complete your Salat al-Isha. So this is the hadith of Sayyidina Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala an, which ties in with the previous hadith how? Because the previous hadith we mentioned that you're, you're not allowed to offer for example Salat al-Isha until you have prayed Salat al-Maghrib. So if you join, if you come to the masjid and you, uh, you have not prayed Salat al-Maghrib and the Imam is praying Salat al-Maghrib, the Jama'ah is praying Salat al-Maghrib <coughs> and you have not, uh, sorry, the Jama'ah praying Salat al-Isha and you have not offered Salat al-Maghrib, then you pray Salat al-Maghrib with them. You pray Salat al-Maghrib with them while they are praying Isha and you remain sitting for the last Raka'ah. For the last Raka'ah you remain sitting and you make Taslim with them and you take this Hadith of Sayyidina Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala that your niyyah is different and the Imam's niyyah is different. La ba'sa bidhalik. There's no problem. La haraj. There's no problem with that. Next Hadith of Sayyidina Anas bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala which we took previously but we'll just pass by quickly where he says that Kunna nusalli ma'a Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi shiddat al-harri. We would offer with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayer in the extreme heat فَإِذَا لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ أَحَدُنَا أَنْ يُمَكِّنَ وَجْهَهُ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ And if one of us was unable to place his forehead upon the earth because of the extreme heat بَسَطَ ثَوْبَهُ فَسَجَدَ عَلَيْهِ Then what would, what would we do? We would, ex, we would, ex, we would uh, outstretch our, our thawb, our garment فَسَجَدَ عَلَيْهِ And we would make sajda on that. So we would outspread our garment and we would make sajda on that. We would put our forehead and our nose on that. This hadith, in actuality, is a refutation upon the rawafid. Upon the rawafid. Because when they pray, when they quote unquote their prayers, then what do they, they have some turba, have some soil which they perform sajda on. Which they put their forehead upon some turba, which some may claim is like from Karbala or from some land which has no importance in our deen. They make sajda on that because their claim is that you have to make sajda on the earth. Your forehead has to touch the earth or has to touch the floor. You're not allowed to make sajda on anything between you and between the, between the floor. So this hadith of Sayyidina Anas bin Malik ta'ala is clear rad upon them. Where the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi he says, Kunna, we would. All of the Sahaba, this is what we would do. وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ سَبِيلٌ كُنَّا سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّي مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُسْلِي جَنَّمْ وَسَاتْ مَصِيرًا That's the path of the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Whoever turns away from that, the path of the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then we will turn him to wherever he has gone and his abode will be the fire of Jahannam na'udh billahi min dhalik. Kunna, we would, all of us, the jama'ah of the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa we would do this practice where if it was extremely hot on the floor because of the intense heat of the sun we were unable to place our foreheads upon the earth soil upon the ground because of the intense heat then we would lay out our garment our thawb our uh, our rida our upper garment and we would make sajda upon that so what i mentioned last time was this is something which is a raqiq something which is light something which is thin they would place our uh, our thobe on the floor. Whereas if it is something, something which is, which is dakhm, something which is very uh, intense, something which is very heavy, very thick, then no, your forehead has to touch, the, like for example, um, a very thick turban, which a person they tie, and it comes from their forehead up to out here. Yeah? Then you cannot be such down that your forehead will not touch the, touch the floor. That, that massive turban will come in between you and between the, between the ground. No. أُمِرْتُ وَنْ أَسْجُدَ عَلَى سَبْعَةِ أَعْظُمْ I have been commanded to prostrate upon seven bones. Among them, الْجَبْهَ وَأَشَارَ إِلَى عَنْفِي The forehead and he pointed to his nose. This area has to touch the ground, has to touch the floor. But if there's something light in between you and between the floor, لا بَاس Then there is no problem. If something thick between you and between the floor, then you have to remove that before you make uh, sajda. So we'll نَكْتَفِي بِهَا We'll conclude with this uh, and we'll continue. Next week I will not be here. I will not be able to make our lesson next week. So 
in a fortnight, inshallah wa ta'ala. Our next lesson will be on Monday, inshallah wa ta'ala, with our uh, Raziyain classes, inshallah. So we'll conclude with this for today. Hada ma'andi wa sallahu ta'ala, ala khayri khalqi Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.